Hi, I'm Cindy Lovelace, and I'm living with PNET. And as a result of that, I became a patient advocate for myself and also for the community at large. I wanted to help others who have been diagnosed with net cancer. So I'm calling my talk with you today, Navigating a Net Cancer Journey and Living Life with Joy. So I live a pretty active life in Old Hickory, Tennessee, near Nashville. I hike and I sail with my husband, and we enjoy a lot of travel. We also spend time with our extended family from East Coast to West Coast, which includes four children and five grandchildren. And in the midst of that, I work full time and deal with a life threatening disease. Actually, I have two cancer diagnoses, breast cancer in 2004 and neuroendocrine in 2011. While I've had my share of downtime with surgeries, treatments and such, I try really hard to prevent net cancer from defining my whole life. I focus on those things that I can do something about, supported by my family and my friends, and also other net patient caregivers, advocates, and I also lean on my personal faith. I try to plan as much or more joy in my life than I do the difficult times. Now, all of us have different ways of trying to cope with down times, and I think it's really important to intentionally do that. Well, back to my initial net diagnosis and what I've learned about patient advocacy for myself and for others. Now, this tumor was found by accident or to use the correct terminology, incidentally. I did not have any symptoms. I presented at the ER a few weeks after breaking my little toe and I was experiencing pain and swelling in my leg and I was feeling quite exhausted. The scans revealed that I was afflicted with blood clots in my leg, which had moved up into my lungs and filled my lungs. And I was feeling pretty darn lucky at that point that I was in the ER. Well, my doctor surmised that because I had been taking an estrogen blocking drug for my breast cancer treatment and that blood clots were a lesser known side effect, they figured that the long-term use of the medication had probably caused the DVT in my leg. So it turns out that was only partially correct. There was something else going on. Fortunately, I had directed that all of my scans and my report from that ER visit be sent to my oncologist, my breast cancer oncologist. And as she flipped through them a month later at a routine office visit, she inquired about the technician's notation regarding a small suspicious shadow in the area of my pancreas. And I learned my very first important patient advocate lesson here. I did well to have the report sent to my oncologist, but I should have also requested a copy of those scans for myself and also the report from the doctor interpreting the scan. Educating yourself is just as important as the education of your doctor. And we'll talk more about that later. My breast cancer oncologist ordered follow-up scans and she referred me to a gastroenterologist to figure out what might be going on. And I ultimately had an endoscopic ultrasound which revealed a neuroendocrine tumor. Now I had to practice that quite a while and learn to spell it. And I was certainly not pleased when my oncologist told me that she really didn't know much about neuroendocrine tumors, that they were rare. And so I was told by my physician doing the ultrasound that I shouldn't worry about it, that neuroendocrine tumors are almost always benign until I got the phone call that it was not. And so I was also uh, told that the report showed that the tumor was in my stomach. Turns out that was wrong too. So armed with all this confusing information, I was referred to a surgeon who scheduled me for a resection. So it turns out he didn't know much about neuroendocrine tumors either, but he was a really crack surgeon. When he went in to remove the tumor from my stomach, he discovered that it wasn't there. And so he didn't give up. He used his surgeon hands to go through all the organs in that vicinity until he found a small tumor in the tail of my pancreas. And then I had half my pancreas removed 
along with several lymph nodes in my spleen, and I was pronounced cancer-free. Go live your life. So I learned another important lesson in patient advocacy. Ask a lot of questions. Follow up with your own research. Maybe even seek a second opinion. Turns out I was not cancer-free. Six months later, in October 2011, a CNN report changed my life and my neuroendocrine cancer path. I learned that Steve Jobs had just died from neuroendocrine cancer, which began in, guess where, his pancreas, and it had metastasized to his liver. Who knew? I didn't. And his case sounded disturbingly like mine, except I was cancer-free, right? No one had ever mentioned that even a small neuroendocrine tumor resected with clear margins could spread. It was a revelation that sent me to Google again, and I learned there was a neuroendocrine center in my city that my oncologist didn't know about. However, she did know the doctor. Their families actually socialized together, but she had no idea that he was treating neuroendocrine patients. So my first visit with this expert doctor made me feel like I had struck gold. So much information that I did not know before. And I was sent to have a liver MRI and it showed nothing remarkable. However, this physician recommended a gallium 68 scan. Later, I figured out that I was one of the first group of people in the US to actually have this scan in this country through a clinical trial. It showed two tumors in my liver. A resection of one confirmed mid-grade neuroendocrine cancer. So another lesson in patient advocacy, do research and also check on clinical trials. There's a lot of hope on the horizon. So let me pause here and say that it was not until I started attending patient conferences. The first one was actually a national conference put on by NCAN. And then I started looking at their resources. And then I noticed other organizations that were holding informational conferences and had resources on their websites. And I found that these were really vetted and had really good information about neuroendocrine that I would not find on other more typical cancer related websites like American Cancer Society. And so NCAN, LACNETS, NorCal Carcinet, the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation or NETREF, and now HealingNet Foundation, all organizations that have really good information specifically about neuroendocrine cancer and it goes way above and provides more accurate information than other more common cancer websites like cancer.org or the American Cancer Society. And there's also a lot of online support groups that offer really helpful information as well. But it was not until I really started digging into understanding my disease that I could understand why some people would say carcinoid and other people would say neuroendocrine. I didn't know what grading meant. I didn't know what KI-67 meant. I didn't know what somatostatin analogs were and how they worked. It was important for me to educate myself. I can't stress enough the importance of educating yourself, but also not depending on what Google finds. Hey, I got lucky with that CNN report. Online, you can find organizations I mentioned and others you can trust to provide you with good vetted information from net expert physicians and also from net patients. So here's the boxes that I've checked in the last 10 years and how my advocacy journey has moved forward. So my initial surgery was a distal pancreatic resection and splendectomy, followed a year later by a tumor resection of my liver and a few years after that, a more robust debulking of my liver with several tumors removed from my mesentery and a resection of my, of my gallbladder. The lessons I learned about surgery, well, ask a lot of questions in advance and prepare yourself physically and mentally. Understand your insurance policy and double check that everyone who will be taking part from the surgeon to the anesthesiologist to the pathologist is covered. Surround yourself with trusted people caregivers who can step in and do specific tasks for you. Take rest and recovery very seriously. 
call the doctor if something doesn't feel right, and inject humor wherever possible. Hi, I'm Dr. Clown. 50 cc's of silly coming your way. <laughs> So that really happened and thanks to my while I was having surgery or prepping for surgery and thanks to my comedian daughter for that little uh, episode there. Well, to follow up on an earlier patient advocacy lesson learned regarding your own copy of scans and reports, I also recommend that you request a copy of your pathology report after surgery or biopsy. And I've also had my share of waiting and monitoring. I am monitored with a combination of MRIs and PET dotatate scans. I learned that the type of scan you have, where you have it, and who reads it is also important. If you can consistently do it at the same center, that is optimal, but that's not always possible, but you can get the right scans. And I've endured the monthly somatostatin analog injections, and I've learned that I don't need to settle for shots that are not administered correctly. If the nurse giving the shot can't answer a basic question about what he or she is doing, or you end up with a really sore butt and a big lump, you are not getting optimal treatment. Insist that they watch the video or the manufacturer's website, or at least read the instructions that come with the box. Don't settle for, oh, I've given lots of butt shots. They are not the same. I've also had systemic treatments, four rounds of Ludothera PRRT, and currently I'm on CAPTEM. I've learned how important it is to have a team of experts on my side when making treatment decisions. I currently have at least three physicians on my multidisciplinary team, a surgeon, oncologist, and nuclear medicine physician, and all are net experts. That team could look differently depending on where you live and what access you have to net experts. But at a minimum, I would suggest that your local doctor must be willing to seek answers and advice from someone who is a true net expert. And this is not hard for your doctor to access. Most of the net experts I know are more than willing to do this. Building trust with a team of doctors is so important because while we are blessed to have lots of treatment options now and more coming down the road, it requires trust in your team to feel confident that you are going in the right direction. That trust helps me live my life knowing I will have periods of stabilization and periods of possible progression. I accept that I am not cured of net cancer, but I know I have a team of net experts who monitor my disease and have knowledge of options that are available for me and my unique path. I mentioned earlier that I work full time. Well, that work has changed a lot since I was diagnosed with neuroendocrine cancer. I had a long radio career as a news reporter and on-air announcer, and then in promotions and marketing. So after 30 plus years of being immersed in communications, I entered the nonprofit sector to run fundraising events for a National Cancer Research Foundation. In 2011, that Steve Jobs story on CNN that prompted a random Google search and led me to a net expert in my own city. Well, that guy was Eric Liu. And we didn't just talk about me. We began talking about what we each did. And just maybe if we worked together as a patient and a doctor, each with that perspective, then maybe we could figure out ways to change the paradigm of patients struggling for years to get diagnosed or to get the right answers and then the right treatment to receive optimal care in an optimal timeline. So the founding of the Healing Net Foundation began in 2013. And eight years later, our organization has grown to a focus on education and collaboration particularly on education of physicians, nurses, and healthcare providers, as well as resources vetted by the medical experts and written by patients themselves to help each of you better navigate this unique and challenging net cancer journey. We have joined other organizations I mentioned earlier in trying to fill all the gaps of net care. And we want each of you to live your life the best you can. 
I want to make a point here that I don't see myself as particularly special as I've grown into this field of advocating for myself and advocating for others. I simply paid attention to what was happening to me and I related it to others and how it might impact them. And then when I found myself in a place where just maybe I could take what I had learned so far from my career and my cancer diagnosis and my life in general and do something good with it. I took a leap. I learned from others who were already advocates. I learned from net experts who I must say love talking about what they know. And I learned from many other patient stories. I listened and read a lot at first. And then as I learned, I built upon my own communication skills to tell my story in a way that I hoped others could relate to it and maybe learn something helpful. Even beyond Healing Net Foundation, I will be advocating the rest of my life for better awareness, education, and collaboration so that net patients can receive optimal care. And as you look to set intentions in your life, find ways to cope and to find joy, you can advocate as well in ways that fit you. First, you must educate yourself. Choose doctors who are educated and willing to be educated and build that trust with them. Find support in your family, in friends, other patients, caregivers, and advocates. And then you will likely have to take a little bit of a leap yourself by telling your own story in various ways or becoming an active volunteer. But that leap just might be the way that you do find joy and that you learn to cope with a net cancer journey. So we're going to be doing some questions and answers today, but here's my email contact information and our website again. And if you want to reach out to share your story or find a way to be an advocate, we can start a dialogue. Thank you. And I'll leave you with a piece of joy that I try to experience as much as possible. This is a gorgeous sunset on Old Hickory Lake in Tennessee. Thank you.